Well, welcome back, folks. We're um, doing a larger investigation into creativity and the pursuit of wisdom and how those two things um, need to be combined with one another. Um, you can't just go after creativity uh, on its own and hold it up as the great good in education on its own because um, that has rather uh, negative consequences in the world as we've talked about in the introductory lecture. So today what I want to do is um, go uh, step back a little bit and think about um, some of the ancient and medieval understandings of uh, creative, or not creativity, of wisdom. Um, but I want to do this first of all by thinking about some of the lost words uh, from ancient times for thinking and knowing. Okay, um, You know, we talk a lot about thinking and knowing and education departments uh, and Bachelor of Education programs. Um, but it's important for us to understand that um, you know, not everybody thinks about these things the same way as we do in modern times, and that sometimes um, there's language available that's been lost that can actually shake things up for us and make us see things a little bit differently and maybe open up our minds to um, ways of understanding that, you know, maybe we haven't run across before. So, um, I want you to understand, too, that these words that I'm going to expose you to from ancient times, um, they're not, they're not jargon, okay? Um, you get a lot of jargon in education programs, that's for sure, but please understand that these are not jargon. They're rather indications of how careful Greek and Latin authors were in their attempts to differentiate thinking, right? Not just use one word, but pull thinking apart, just like the Inuit there uh, have all these different words for for snow, right? Here, we're, we're trying to differentiate the different aspects of thinking, to distinguish different sorts of experiences of thinking from one another, according to their objects. So, let's explore this. Let's uh, talk about rethinking how we think about thinking. I want to talk about our modern ideas about theory, the big word theory, versus uh, ancient understandings um, of theoria, contemplatio or contemplation, right? The modern word theory, um, you know, makes a person groan very often, right? It just, uh, teachers don't have a lot of time for theorists. Uh, you know, we want to get right down to business. We want to get down to the nitty gritty, the lesson plans, the stuff we can use, all the practical things. A theorist sounds like somebody just with their head in the clouds, right? But theory or theoria or contemplatio or contemplation in the ancient sense didn't, didn't mean that. Okay, so let's explore that. We often use the word contemplation today to name any sort of deep thinking whatsoever. However, the ancient roots of this word are rich with a specific meaning that has largely been forgotten today and that merits recollection. It's correct to suppose that the word contemplation or contemplatio in Latin and theoria in Greek names a kind of cognitive activity the ancient sense of this word must be distinguished from the processes of critical analytic reasoning with which we most commonly associate it. All right? We don't really f understand the way that it was used in ancient times. Indeed, Theoria names something that is not of much concern in our modern educational efforts. Our word theory is used generally to speak about a grand idea or a hypothesis. Theories are very often criticized as being dissociated from experience or the real world. This is why we say theories must be tested to see how well they work in practice. We counterpose theory to practice. I mean, Dewey's the most famous guy, right? He says, an ounce of uh, practice is worth a ton of theory, right? I mean, he doesn't have much use for theory, even though he's written books and books of theory. I don't know. But anyway, that's, that's how it works in today's society and in today's modern times. Theory is commonly um, subject to scorn by pragmatists like Dewey. Um, theory suggests something divorced from experience or abstract. Very often it's tied instead to 
arcane, obscure, or esoteric concepts and imposed ends that, unlike experience, are not available to everyone, but only to a few professional thinkers and smarty-pants types, right? However, this notion of theory as being divorced from experience and as concerned with a priori metaphysical concepts is a modern misunderstanding. At its root, our word theory comes from theoria, meaning seeing, contemplating, beholding, or gazing upon. Certainly then, theory is deeply experiential. Right? So it's not something divorced from experience. It's deeply sp experiential. What are you doing when you're beholding, when you're gazing upon your, your beloved, right? Is that not deeply experiential? Ancient medieval writers supposed that theory was the deepest sort of experience and the most authoritative sort of knowing. For the empirical scientific methods of knowing rely on the senses and Sense experience attends to the phenomenal world of appearances, but the experience of phenomenal appearance is not the same as the direct, unmediated experience of beholding substance or essence or being or reality itself. Similarly, even argumentative or analytic reasoning is of inferior quality when compared uh, to theoria. Reason has an advantage over sensation, in that it's not beholden directly to the evidence of the senses, but it's still inferior to theory inasmuch as reason is always on the way to its object. And its object must be something that is subject to analytic thought, whereas theoria possesses, or rather is possessed by, its object. See? All right. A um, couple people that I really appreciate and enjoy reading... Uh, maybe you've read them already. Um, if you're my students, you, you likely have. Um, Martin Buber and Annie Dillard. I'd like to give you some examples of theoria from poetry and literature and philosophy from them. Martin Buber's big book that um, is probably the most influential and famous one is called I and Thou. And um, there are these two components of um, being human that uh, Martin Buber wants to talk about with us and expose us to. One's called I it experience and one's called I thou relation. All right, So I it experience is the sort of thing that you or I do whenever we have to get out there and get stuff done you know when we're driving to work uh, you know we're we're paying attention to the rules of the road we're we're measuring basic, you know, the, hopefully we're measuring the distance between us and the car in front of us so that we're not tailgating or, you know, or, or when you're, um, when you're uh, building a house or when you're, whatever you're doing, like these sorts of things where you're, in other words, you're, you are the subject, you're standing over against an object, all right, um, and you're manipulating it, you're mastering it in some fashion. This is how we got to live, right? We, we got to get stuff done in the world. That's I it experience, and it's very, very important that we learn how to do that effectively in order to make ends meet and you know get you know get our food and live. But then there's this other kind, I thou, I thou relation, right? That's where you or I, we don't just deal with each other like we're um, you know student numbers or we're just some statistic. Uh, we don't just deal with each other like objects. We actually come to see each other deeply and know each other by loving, all right? Whereas I, it experience kind of um, asks us to be objective and, and, and not, not love in order to understand, but stand, like, you know, hold, withhold ourselves objectively from that which we're trying to understand. Um, I, thou relationship, we can only know by loving. All right, so these are the two things, and you could do this with people, right? You could do this with, um, I mean, you could do this with a tree, you could do this with a sunset, you can do this with, you can do this with your food, <laughs> you know? Um, you know, we'll go to, say, McDonald's, right? You have a Big Mac or something, and you just have an I-it experience with your food. You gobble it down. Uh, but, you know, if you're, again, I guess the Inuit example, right? You're, you're up north, you, uh, you catch a seal, 
Uh, you don't just, you know, kill it. You pray over it. You speak to it. You you uh, talk to it. You thank its spirit. You 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 enter into it in a personal encounter, right? So um, this is a very important aspect of of living and of life too. And so Buber wants us to remember that we have to do both these things. And I guess the tendency is that we only do the I it. Um, or we tend towards only doing the I it um, experience thing uh, that we that we for whatever reason we stop seeing each other we stop seeing the world around us um, you know in this I thou relational way right it just becomes this this object of mastery for us to dominate and technology is part of that problem, I would submit to you, right? Um, technology is all about learning how to dominate and transform and make the world in your image and the rest of it. So there's a lot um, that pushes us towards a dominating, all-encompassing kind of an I-it experience and then I-thou kind of fades off. So let me, uh, let me read to you a little bit um, from Martin Buber's book, I-thou, here. These are just little sections. It says, The life of a human being does not exist merely in the sphere of goal-directed verbs. It does not consist merely of activities that have something for their object. I perceive something. I feel something. I imagine something. I want something. I sense something. I think something. The life of a human being does not consist merely of all this and its like. All this, and its like, is the basis of the realm of it. But the realm of you has another basis. Whoever says you doesn't have something for his object. For wherever there is something, there is also another something. Every it borders on other its. It is only by virtue of of bordering on others. But where you is said, there is something. Or there is no something. You has no borders. Whoever says you does not have something, he has nothing. But he stands in relation. We are told that man experiences his world. And what does this mean? Right There's Dewey, right? Man experiences his world. What does this mean? Man goes over the surface of things and experiences them. He brings back from them some knowledge of their condition and experience. He experiences what there is to things. But it is not experiences alone that bring the world to man. For what they bring to him is only a world that consists of it and it and it, and he, and he, and she, and she, and it. I experience something. All this is not changed by adding inner experiences to the external ones in line with the non-eternal distinction that is um, born of mankind's craving to take, some, take the edge off the mystery of death. Inner things, like external things, things among things, I experience something. And all this is not changed by adding mysterious experiences to manifest ones, self-confident in the wisdom that recognizes a secret compartment in things reserved for the initiated and holds the key. O oh, mysteriousness without mystery, O oh, piling up of information, it, it, it. <laughs> Those who experience do not participate in the world, for the experience is in them, and not between them and the world. The world does not participate in experience. It allows itself to be experienced, but it is not concerned, for it contributes nothing, and nothing happens to it. The world as experience belongs to the basic word, I, it. The basic word, I, you, establishes the world of relation. Um, there are three spheres in which the world of relation arises. 
the first, life with nature. Here the relation vibrates in the dark and remains below language. The creatures stir across from us, but they are unable to come to us. And the you, we say to them, sticks to the threshold of language. The second, life with men. Here the relation is manifest and enters language. We can give and receive the you. The third, life with spiritual beings. Here the relation is wrapped in a cloud but reveals itself. It lacks but creates language. We hear no you and yet feel addressed. We answer, creating, thinking, acting. With our being, we speak the basic word, unable to say you with our mouth. But how can we incorporate into the world of the basic word what lies outside language? In every sphere, through everything that becomes present to us, we gaze toward the training of the eternal you, or the train of the eternal you. In each we perceive a breath of it. In every you we address the eternal you in every sphere according to its manner. Nice example for you here now. I contemplate a tree. I can accept it as a picture, a rigid pillar in a flood of light, or splashes of green traversed by the gentleness of the blue silver ground. I can feel it as movement, the flowing veins around the sturdy striving core, the sucking of the roots, the breathing of the leaves, the infinite commerce with the earth and air, and the growing itself in its darkness. I can assign to it a species and observe it as an instance with an eye to its construction and its way of life. I can overcome its uniqueness and form so rigorously that I recognize it only as an expression of the law. Those laws according to which a constant opposition of forces is continually adjusted. Or those laws according to which the elements mix and separate. I can dissolve it into a number, into a pure relation between numbers, and eternalize it. Throughout all of this, the tree remains my object, and has its place and its time span, its kind and condition. But it can also happen, if will and grace are joined, that as I contemplate the tree, I am drawn into a relation, and the tree ceases to be an it. The power of exclusiveness has seized me. This does not require me to forego any of the modes of contemplation. <clears throat> um, there is nothing that I must not see in order to see, and there is no knowledge that I must forget. Rather, is everything, picture and movement, species and instance, law and number included and inseparably fused. Whatever belongs to the tree is included. Its form and its mechanics, its color and its chemistry, its conversation with the elements and its conversation with the stars. All this in its entirety. The tree is no impression, no play of my imagination, no aspect of a mood. It confronts me bodily and has to deal with me as I must deal with it, only indifferently. One should not try to dilute the meaning of the relation. Relation is reciprocity. Does the tree then have a consciousness similar to our own? I have no experience of that. But thinking that you have brought this off in your own case, must you again divide the indivisible? What I encounter is neither the soul of a tree nor a dryad, but the tree itself. I mean, have you guys ever had this happen, right? You, you know, you, I imagine some of you camp, right? You, um, you can go out into the woods and, um, you know, wander around. And I guess if, suppose you're a, a lumberman, right? You see a gigantic redwood and you're like, oh, well, that redwood tree, I could cut that down and make all kinds of board foot out of that. I could, I could, well, I could get rich off of that tree, right? 
you calculate it and you figure out what a wonderful chair it would make or how many houses it could make. Versus other times where, you know, you're out, uh, maybe not in that frame of mind, and you see the same redwood, and you see it and how big it is and how ancient it must be and how thousands and thousands of years old maybe it must be and how you can't reach around its trunk. Even if you held hands with six other people, you couldn't reach around it. It's so big. And, you know, it's covered in moss and it's this ancient smell all around it and it's just this, it really shakes you up, you know? Then you've had a different kind of an experience, whereas the first one is more of an I-it experience. The second one is a I-thou experience, right? This is the kind of thing Boober's talking about. I'm sure everybody here or listening has, um, has felt these things. Okay, so that's just a little snippet out of uh, Boober's book. And here's some um, uh, snippets out of Annie Dillard's uh, book called Pilgrim at Tinker Creek. It's one of my faves. I think Dillard is someone I'd recommend anybody to read. She's so good. Relying on examples from Marius von Senden's book, Space and Light, Annie Dillard discusses instances of the way that newly sighted people, like people who once were blind, and I guess they get cataract surgery, right? Um, How, wow, now, before I'd never seen anything, right? And now I can see what, what this is like, right? So Annie Dillard writes... In general, the newly sighted see the world as a dazzle of color patches. They are pleased by the sensation of color and learn quickly to to name the colors, but the rest of seeing is tormentingly difficult. Dillard records that many newly sighted people find seeing oppressive because it causes them to be aware of the tremendous size of the world which before seemed more manageable. Many refuse uh, to use their newfound vision at all, instead relying on their other senses, lapsing into apathy and despair from what one doctor called the rapid and complete loss of that striking and wonderful serenity which is characteristic only of those who have never yet seen. Unquote. Dillard writes, On the other hand, many newly sighted people speak well of the world, and teach us how dull is our own vision. A little girl visits a garden. She is greatly astonished and can scarcely be persuaded to answer, stands speechless in front of a tree, which she only names on taking hold of it, and then as the tree with the lights in it. (laughs) Why didn't someone hand those newly sighted people paints and brushes from the start when they Uh, still didn't know what anything was. Then maybe we all could see color patches too. The world unraveled from reason. Eden before Adam gave names. The scales would drop from my eyes. I'd see trees like men walking. I'd run down the road against all orders, hallooing and leaping. You know, Annie Diller is like, wow, you know, when you, when you, uh, you can see, you can really see in a way that, you know, you or I fail to see because we're so deadened to things, right? This young girl can see things. Fresh eyes. All right, so um, more about the relation between contemplation seeing and creativity here. Dillard discusses uh, the two sorts of seeing about which Buber speaks in his discussion of I, it, and I, thou. He says, when I see in this way, namely from the I-it attitude, I analyze and pry. I hurl over logs and roll away stones. I study the bank a square foot at a time, probing and tilting my head. You know, Dillard, she went and lived out in the woods, kind of like Thoreau, right? Some days, when a mist covers the mountains, when the muskrats won't show up, and the microscope's mirror shatters, I want to climb up the bank blue dome as a man would storm the inside of a circus tent wildly dangling and with a steel knife claw a rent and, and rent the top peep if I must and if I must fall. But there is another kind of seeing, the I thou attitude, that involves a letting go. Right? So the first one is her going out and, you know, wrestling truth from the world, right? Going and exploring and seeing and 
prying things apart and analyzing and figuring out how stuff works. And This other kind involves a letting go. When I see this way, I sway transfixed and emptied. The difference between the two ways of seeing is the difference between walking with and walking without a camera. <laughs> Think about that next time you've got your friggin' iPhone with you, right? When I walk with a camera, I walk from shot to shot, reading the light on a calibrated meter. When I walk without a camera, my own shutter opens, and the moment's light prints on my own silver gut. When I see this second way, I am above all an unscrupulous observer. As a poet, Dillard's creative task is to see, to engage in contemplation, in theoria, in seeing as one who is newly sighted. Let me read this longer passage from uh, um, Tinker Creek for you. It was a sunny or it was sunny one evening last summer at Tinker Creek. The sun was low in the sky upstream. I was sitting on the sycamore log bridge with the sunset at my back, watching the shiners uh, the size of minnows who were feeding over the muddy sand in skittery schools. Again and again, one fish then another turned for a split second across the, fla uh, the current and flash. The sun shot out from its silver side. I couldn't watch for it. It was always just happening somewhere else, and it drew my vision just as it disappeared. Like flash, like a sudden dazzle on the thinnest blade, a spark over a dun and olive ground at chance intervals from every direction. Then I noticed white specks, some sort of pale petals, small floating from, the, un, from under my feet on the creek's surface, very slow and steady, so I blurred my eyes and gazed towards the brim of my hat and saw a new world. I saw the pale white circles roll up, roll up, like the world's turning, mute and perfect, and I saw the linear flashes gleaming silver like stars being born at random, down a rolling scroll of time. Something broke and something opened. I filled up like a new wineskin. I breathed in air like light. I saw a light like water. I was the lip of a fountain, the creek that, fill, that filled forever. I was at ether, the leaf in the zephyr. I was flesh flake, feather, bone. When I see this way, I see truly. As Thoreau says, I return to my senses. I am the man who watches the baseball game in the silence in an empty stadium. I see the game purely. I am abstracted and dazed. When it's all over and the white-suited players lope off the green field to their shadowed dugouts, I leap to my feet. I cheer and cheer. But I can't go out and try to see this way. <laughs> Have you ever done that? I've done that. It's ridiculous. I'll fail. I'll go mad. All I can do is try to gag the commentator to hush the noise of useless interior babble that keeps me from seeing just as surely as a newspaper dangled before my eyes. The effort is a really disciplined it is really a discipline requiring a lifetime of dedicated struggle, right? When we meditate, when we sit and we meditate, that's what we're doing, ladies and gentlemen. It marks the literature of saints and monks, of every order, east and west, under every rule and no rule, discalced and shod. The world's spiritual geniuses seem to discover universally that the mind's muddy river, this ceaseless flow of trivia and trash, cannot be damned. And that trying to damn it is a waste of effort that might lead to madness. Instead, you must allow the muddy river to flow unheeded in the dim channels of consciousness. You raise your sights. You look along it, mildly acknowledging its presence without interest and gazing beyond it into the realm of the real, 
where subjects and objects act and rest purely without utterance. Launch into the deep, says Jacques Ellul, and you shall see. Hmm. The secret of seeing is, then, the pearl of great price. If I thought he could teach me to find it and keep it forever, I'd stagger barefoot across a hundred deserts after any lunatic at all. But although the pearl may be found, it may not be sought. <laughs> the literature of illumination reveals this above all. Although it comes to those who wait for it, it is always, even the most practiced and adept, a gift and a total surprise. Man, you know, Annie Dillard wrote this when she was in her early 20s. It just makes me feel like a loser. I just can't believe this, that she just understood all of this. So young. Anyway, I return from one walk knowing where the killdeer nest in the field by the creek and the hour uh, the laurel blooms. I return from the same walk a day later, scarcely knowing my own name. Litanies hum in my ear. My tongue flaps in my mouth. Alanon, alleluia. I cannot cause light. The most I can do is try to put myself in the path of its beam. It is possible, in deep space, to sail on solar wind. Light, be it particle or wave, has force. You rig a giant sail and you go. The secret of seeing is to sail on solar wind. Hone and spread your spirit till you yourself are a sail, wetted, translucent, broadside to the merest puff. When her doctor took her bandages off and led her into the garden, the girl, who was no longer blind, saw the tree with the lights in it. It was for this tree I searched through the peach orchards of summer, in the forests of fall, and down winter and spring for years. Then one day I was walking along Tinker Creek, thinking of nothing at all, and I saw the tree with the lights in it. <laughs> I saw the backyard cedar, where the morning doves roost, charged and transfigured, each cell buzzing with flame. I stood on the grass with the lights in it. The grass that was holy fire, utterly focused and utterly dreamed. It was less like seeing than like being for the first time seen knocked breathless by a powerful glance. The flood of fire abated, but I'm still spending the power. Gradually the lights went out in the cedar. The colors died. The cells unflamed and disappeared. I was still ringing. I had been my whole life a bell and never knew it until that moment I was lifted and struck. I have since only very seen, very rarely seen the tree with the lights in it. The vision comes and goes, mostly. But I live for it. For the moment when the mountains open and a new light roars in spate through the crack and the mountains slam. <laughs> wow, eh? Holy cow. Any questions or comments? We could take these up in class next time I see you. Thanks for listening.